afternoon, Dr. Alan Christensen here with you. Welcome to another installment of Office Hours Live. So good to connect, good to connect. If you've not been here before, welcome. My name is Dr. Alan Christensen. I am a naturopathic endocrinologist, and I like to figure out how to naturally get your hormones healthy again. <laughs> hormones are really the intersection between lifestyle and health and disease, and there's a lot you can do about them, and we'll talk about that. So hormones, weight, metabolism, food, diet, uh, energy levels, thyroid, those are the big topics. And I'm with you guys on Instagram, on Facebook, and on YouTube Live. So we've got a couple of really good questions that were sent in beforehand, and I'll go back and forth between getting some of those and then getting some of the ones that come in today. So love to hear where you're located. I'm always curious about that. We've got some folks sometimes from just all over the world and always eager to hear about where you are. I'm just getting my screens going properly here. Okay, here we go. Uh, I am currently in northern Minnesota uh, in a lake, on, on a lake, in the woods by a lake, and enjoying it very much so. So, and yeah, keeping an eye on all those platforms. When you want to ask a question, if you do, give it something with a lot of detail. I'm seeing a lot of you guys jumping on right now live on Instagram. Welcome, welcome. A bunch of you on Facebook. Uh, Naples, Florida, uh, Western Colorado. I'm seeing some new names and some old ones. We've got Lexi back with us from Vegas, uh, Melody in Maryland back with us, got some from Salem, Massachusetts, South Florida as well, Northern New Jersey. So yeah, good to see you guys. Uh, say hi, and tell me where you're from. And if there are some big questions, I got plenty that were sent in in before. We got someone here from Santa Fe, New Mexico. We got family in Santa Fe. It's a beautiful, beautiful town. We'd love to visit there. So yeah, welcome, welcome there, Marissa. Uh, Texas, howdy from Texas. That's cool. <laughs> got a big chunk of the country. No one international just yet. Uh, Anaheim, but usually we get many international attendees as well. You know, time zone differences and all that. Mm. Right on cue, we got our first Canadian joining. Also Washington, D.C. So detailed questions coming in already. Welcome, welcome those. Yeah, please put them in. Ohio. Typically, we're in Arizona. We're back and forth between Arizona and northern Minnesota, but really been enjoying the summer up here and excited to see the leaves change sometime soon. Um, Wisconsin. Oh, Bev's right down the road. Good to see you, Bev. Welcome, welcome. So yeah, I'm with you all on some are on YouTube, some are on Facebook, some are on Instagram, and it's all good. There'll be some images I refer to on occasion. They'll show up on YouTube and Facebook. So that, that's all fine, but I'll always explain them as well. Let me grab a couple of the questions in advance. Vincent has one about hyperthyroidism, and that's a great topic, Vincent. I'll, any more detail you want to put, I'm happy to address that as well, but I'll come back to that one in a bit. So other questions, yeah, thyroid disease is always fair game. I do hear people ask if they can ask about non-thyroid questions too. And of course, within that realm of Weight, diet, food, hormones, that, that's my area of expertise. I've got um, <clears throat> seven, seven different books I've written on related topics and a new one coming out in this coming year. And this new one's going to be a focused cookbook on all about food and recipes for helping to heal hormones. That's going to be a lot of fun. I've got it done. We're finalizing the photography and the layout and excited to share that with you guys. Uh, here's someone from Louisiana. More questions coming in. How to explain hypo symptoms not being taken seriously. Yeah, peace and palm trees. Thank you for that. I saw some other questions that you had sent in before too, and I've got a few of those queued up. If you want to put more details on that one, I'll, I'll look at it either way. But yeah, I'm happy to cover these. Kathy is here with us. Hey, Kathy. Welcome, welcome. Okay, so I'm going to jump into a couple of the first ones. And some of these were related. Some of these had some overlap. So some that were sent in, one was this, I'm taking your daily reset pack along with nodule control and antibody support. I have osteoporosis. Are there any other supplements I should add to what I am taking? Yeah, just to touch on that one, great question. So osteoporosis, this is a really big deal and it's super common. There's a big gender disparity with it, but a lot of guys have it too. And if you don't know, that means severe thinning of the bones. And before one is at overt 
osteoporosis, there's also osteopenia, which is the same thing, but just a little early, earlier along and just not quite as severe as far as the amount of overall bone loss. So yeah, osteoporosis, osteopenia, extremely common and very significant. So supplementation can be helpful for them. The old models were that we thought it just took massive, massive amounts of calcium. And we now know that calcium is necessary. It's gotta be there, but the more isn't better. And it's not a matter of the more calcium you take, the more effective it is. In fact, we're learning now that calcium can be counterproductive. Even if it does seem to make a difference with bones, it may calcify and it may raise the risk of cardiovascular disease. So the trick about calcium is that you want it in the context of other minerals and nutrients, and you want it in types and amounts that are safe and effective. Holly's with us. Welcome, Holly. I'm seeing many more come on. Yeah, good to be with you guys. Uh, I'm just watching questions and comments coming in, and we're going to get to a bunch of these today. So happy to, happy to be with you. <laughs> Frankie's with us from Waco, Texas, where it's too hot. Yeah, Frankie, I got to say, I'm really happy being up here in the summertime. I think that today our high didn't even get to 70 degrees. So it was just, just beautiful. And yeah, we did have a couple of days where we used the air conditioner, but I think like three or four might be about it. So that's been, that's been really neat. I have been in the Phoenix area for the last 25 years. So I'm due to not be in a full summer. <laughs> but back to osteoporosis. So yeah, so calcium is necessary, but more of it is not better. It really takes a full range of minerals and adequate protein. Uh, vitamin K is an important thing. So vitamin K and the vitamin K isomers, they help calcium mineralize, but they prevent it from calcifying. And that's the game. You want calcium to mineralize the bones, but you don't want it to calcify the joints or the blood vessels. And then the type of calcium matters too. So you want the most soluble versions of calcium. And the best data I can find on that is relevant to the plant-derived types. And the last thought about calcium is, what if you're on thyroid meds? Some types of calcium need many, many, many hours after thyroid meds for the thyroid meds to absorb, like six or 10 hours. So you crunch all that together, and I've decided that calcium citrate fits the bill in the best ways. And it doesn't take a huge dose of that. Currently, uh, Keb, you're talking about the Daily Reset Pack. We've got the Daily Reset Bundle as our latest iteration. And in that, I include 300 milligrams of calcium citrate. But it's along with a full spectrum vitamin K, all the vitamin K subtypes of it, and magnesium, molybdenum, uh, boron, zinc, selenium, uh, manganese, all the key trace minerals that go with that. And then we think too about vitamin D. I won't spend too much depth on vitamin D right now because it has come up, but you do want some, but more is not better. In fact, more is counterproductive. So some looks like blood levels of between somewhere in the mid thirties to mid fifties nanograms per mil. Above that though, it may be counterproductive in a lot of ways. So I've included a basal starting dose of a thousand units in the daily reset bundle. And I feel really good about that in light of some of the recent big studies on vitamin D. So related questions. So another theme you guys about office hours is that I love to go deep in particular topics uh, because if we see follow-up questions, we can cover things at a level of depth we wouldn't really get to otherwise. So when I see questions on a theme we've already discussed, I'm more apt to jump onto those. Uh, quick one, Laurel, are you saving this live? So yeah, Laurel, when I'm done, I will repost this. That'll show up on Instagram, also on YouTube and Facebook. You can totally check it all out because you just came on, you missed some stuff at the beginning and you can get the rest of it. And you may not stick around for all of it, but you can catch it afterwards if you choose not to. So yes. Uh, so related one, do you need vitamin C and K2 and magnesium to best absorb vitamin D? Nope. Easy answer, nope. <laughs> now, nutrients work better together, but in the case of absorption, that's not really a factor. So there's no big barriers by which you don't absorb vitamin D without those other nutrients. But the overall clinical outcomes are better when they are working together. So last one that was pre-sent that's kind of related was do hypo meds deplete vitamins and minerals? Uh, which ones need to supplement? So this is a really good question. And I'm going to drop an answer up. I can put this link on all these platforms. So let me just get 
to where I've got my links here. There we go. So the answer is yes. Not only do the meds deplete a lot of nutrients, but nutrient requirements are different for those with thyroid disease in terms of the chemical form of nutrients that are safest and most effective, and also in terms of how they best combine with one another. And I'm gonna drop this as a comment here that goes in on a comment from a different viewer account that I've got on Instagram. And now I'm gonna go over and drop this. So you can see this is a comment on Facebook and YouTube. This is the fact sheet about the uh, thyroid daily. And this is the most recent multi that I crafted for thyroid disease. And think of it really as which micronutrients are important, which amounts, which types, because I went through all the literature on that for about a year and a half. And when I was all done with it, that's when I made this mixture. So this really is my answer to the question of which nutrients would you need differently because of having thyroid disease or having thyroid medications or taking them. So yeah, straightforward one. I've got more that were sent in that I'll come back to, but let me just jump in here and grab one or two of the ones that have come in live today. So for starters, I'll look for some related ones. Um, We've got someone from Alabama with us too. We're seeing more coming in from all over. So here's a follow-up from Marilyn. Uh, Easy Iron. If So Easy Iron is our newer iron product. And this one I'm super excited about in terms of being better absorbed, uh, fewer gastrointestinal side effects, and fewer total pills. You know, if you didn't know this, low iron is a really common problem for many people with thyroid disease. We think about unresolved fatigue, or anemias, or hair thinning, even quality of sleep, or brain fog. Very commonly, the culprit behind those sorts of things is iron. I'm post posting a link about this new formulation. So yeah, so easy iron. Uh, there's never been one like this that has organic acids plus bioperine plus a well-absorbed version of iron in a therapeutic amount. So that's the, that's the setup. And so the question was, if the ferritin reaches mid-normal, should it be continued? What's a good level to maintain? If going off it, how might it affect my levels? Yeah, yeah, so great question, Marilyn. So in terms of very precise numbers, now there's more to iron than just ferritin, I've gotta say that. So ferritin itself can be falsely high, even if someone doesn't have too much iron. And that's because inflammation can skew ferritin. Now, the other point to know is that there's things besides ferritin that are relevant to iron markers and iron metabolism. But assuming that there's not other hidden iron problems, then the ferritin range we think makes the most sense for those with thyroid disease is somewhere in the lowest end would be 50s or 60s. Some would argue a lower end could be more like the 90s or the 100s, but an upper end can be the mid 150s, mid 170s, somewhere around there. So that's an ideal range. That's where you'd wanna be at, Marilyn. If you are there, the question is, do you need to stay on that? You know, an easy thing is to stay on for a period of six months. The problem of iron excess is rarely a problem from someone taking too much and almost always a problem of a false elevation from inflammation or a rare genetic condition called hemochromatosis that causes it to build up. When someone really gets low in iron and it's affected them and they raise it back up again, their odds of having iron excess from oral supplementation are pretty dang small. So yeah, keep an eye on that, Marilyn, but the odds of having it drop off again are probably higher. Now, if iron got low during a time where a woman is having really heavy menstrual cycles, and now let's say she's menopausal, that could be different. She may not need it otherwise, but if iron was low because of malabsorption or because of less in the diet, in those cases, I would say stick with it because the odds are pretty high you'd end up getting low again after a short period of time and no point in getting symptomatic again. Okay, so related questions. Bulletproof coconut, that's kind of funny. <laughs> um, uh, related questions, what is ferritin? My doctor never mentions it. Yeah, peace and palm trees, awesome question. I'm gonna put a link up for you and you can learn a ton from this one. This is all about iron. And the, the short answer is that ferritin is a marker of iron, and it's generally one of the first ones to show up as someone gets low on iron. And people with have autoimmune thyroid disease, shockingly, 35 to 40% of them may also have an autoimmune disease that makes them unable to assimilate iron effectively. 
And in many cases, they can still build up with easy iron, but they're really prone to get low in that and they can struggle with that. There's a lot of ways by which iron affects thyroid function. Iron is necessary for thyroid hormones to be used by the cells, but it's a really big comorbidity along with thyroid disease. And there's a sequence of events that show up as iron gets lower and lower. The first one is that ferritin dips. The next one is that serum iron gets lower and eventually the red blood cells start to change. Uh, also we'll see changes to hemoglobin and hematocrit, but there's this sequence by which the emergent, the initial factor is ferritin that changes. So related one from Liz, if you have a ferritin of 19, how much iron would be recommended? Liz, awesome, awesome question. That, that link that I put about that deep dive on iron, the amount of iron you would need, it actually, it does show that there's a calculator for that. And I don't know if I can drop a picture up and show you guys a picture directly, but it's about three quarters of the way down through the article and it's saying, how much iron do you need? I'm just gonna try to see if I can put a screenshot in my comment. I don't think I can, but I'm gonna try. Okay, so let me see if I can paste that. It won't, let me, oh, wait, wait a minute. Nope, it won't let me paste that to comments. Okay, it's in, the, it's in that article though. And the upshot of it is that it's based upon body weight and also the serum markers. But it's, it's saying how, how many total milligrams of iron someone needs. For easy iron, regardless of the dosage you need, regardless of the total amount of iron you need, the starting dose is one capsule a day. The difference would be how long you would take that and then your targeted blood levels. So the, the exact amount you need is more relevant if someone's taking intravenous iron because you're gonna get a set dose. But for easy iron, you're taking that and your body will absorb that to the point of your requirements. So yeah, one a day is a good starting dose. There are some who are quite low and have malabsorption that may need two daily. That's pretty rare. In most cases, one daily is fine. And that can be taken first thing in the morning with food and along with a daily reset bundle for the other nutrients to help the body utilize it and to correct the deficiency. So yeah, great questions. Okay. Um, I'm gonna see if there's some related ones and then I'll go back and grab one or two that were sent in before. Lots of folks coming on. Um, oh, here's one. So Nicole has a very specific one uh, from Kansas, had an ultrasound done. Does your office offer second opinions of mailed results? I'm in Kansas, showed evidence for active or past thyroiditis. So Nicole, yeah, and everyone else, here's what we offer clinically. So my, my office, the Integrative Health Clinic does work with people in uh, Arizona, California, Washington, Oregon, Montana, and Idaho. Hmm. I think Utah goes in that list. Anyway, Arizona, California, Washington, Oregon are the big ones. Yep. We're licensed for, the, for, six, for six states, but Kansas is not one of those. But you said second opinion, and second opinion is an option for any state and in any country. I'm going to put that link up here. This is thyroidopinion.com, and this is now me personally. Um, I don't always offer these. Uh, I do on occasion. I know I've got a few available for the month of September, and then the schedule is kind of going off again for a little while, but I'll put this over on the Instagram too. So yeah, thyroid opinion, and um, that's exactly, Nicole, the sort of thing that it's for. You could mail in those results. We could talk through that and make sense of what that would mean. So yeah, happy to help out. But again, clinical care. So what that means is the doctors can full on manage someone's uh, requirements. They can prescribe, they can order labs, and that's in those in those main states. Um, Lexi, I see you here a lot, so I gotta jump on your question. Plus it's a related one. I find that to prevent muscle twitches, I need to take extra magnesium, which I take in the evening, 360 milligrams of mag malate. Any problems with that for balance of mag and calcium? I do have osteopenia. Lexi, there's really not a problem with that whatsoever. And if that's helpful for you for the twitching muscles, that's great. That can be a really annoying and sometimes even painful symptom. With osteopenia, please do be sure that you're also getting a good amount of dietary protein somewhere around. So there's an amount of protein to hold on to your lean body mass and an amount to grow your lean body mass to get more lean body mass. So to maintain, that's about a gram of protein per pound of lean body mass per day. Okay. So now to grow lean body mass, that's closer to a gram of protein per pound of body weight per day. And that's a lot. 
So Lex, you'd want a healthy amount of protein and then also definitely including some good weight bearing exercise. You know, ideally strength training with weights, uh, walking, running, things that take some impact or resistance. But people can go a long ways towards reversing bone thinning. That's quite, quite correctable in most instances. Also, Lexi, if I remember correctly, you have been weaning down on thyroid medication. I think you've asked about that before. For anyone else who's here, if you're ever on too much thyroid medication, it's almost impossible to have healthy bones. In fact, it's a huge cause of bone thinning and, and bone fracture. And the first sign of too much is your TSH going below range. So yeah, if you're on too much, that's priority one to reverse for helping your bones do better. Okay. Um, looking at related comments again. Um, oh, Utah, not Idaho. Josh, correct me in the States. Thank you so much for that, Josh. Related question, is iron IV okay for those cases? It sure is. That can be a really good option for people. The easy iron in many cases can work for those to where oral iron could not. And oral is always the first choice. For some people, it's just not an effective option. So Diane's with us. <laughs> Good to see you again. Glad you could be here with us. Um, so related question. So Hannah, <clears throat> Hannah has one chronically low in iron. Latest test level was a nine. I'm guessing, Hannah, you're referring to your ferritin. We're talking about that. Also low in B12, receiving B12 shots weekly, have Hashimoto's, trying to reduce meds. So Hannah, I don't know if you've heard me talk about thyrogastric syndrome. I'm going to get a link here just for you. Um, here we go. Yes. So I'm going to put this link up now in just a moment. There it is. Hannah, yeah, check this out. So I mentioned that super briefly a moment ago, but those that have autoimmune thyroid disease, Hannah, you said you've got Hashimoto, so you're in that category. A big percent of people have an autoimmune condition that damages the parietal cells in the stomach. The parietal cells make stomach acid, but they also make mucin. So the acid is critical to absorb certain nutrients, but the mucin is critical to protect the stomach from acid. Now, a lot of my friends in natural medicine or functional medicine, they talk about people who need to take acid in the form of pills, like hydrochloric acid pills. Well, if someone did have hypochlorhydria because they had autoimmune atrophic gastritis, they'd probably absorb nutrients better and probably digest better if they took hydrochloric acid pills. However, because they're not making mucin, it would likely raise their risk of esophageal cancer and also stomach cancer. So I wouldn't encourage that. But Hannah, in your case, you know, being a runner can cause you to be low in iron. Being a cyclist really doesn't. But being a runner, the impact, the repeated impact does break down some blood cells. Being a woman, if you're of menstruating age, that can cause it as well. But if you're really low in B12 also, you should consider atrophic gastritis as a possibility. And that's even more of a possibility if you do have any ongoing digestive symptoms. It's good to know about because if you have it, you know that you may need to take more aggressive steps to identify and reverse nutrient deficiencies. Also, if the disease is more progressed, you've got to screen against esophageal and stomach cancers. So super important thing. A lot of folks, 35 to 40% of those with Hashimoto's have this. And the tiniest fraction, like less than one in 10, have been diagnosed. So super, super common thing. Please check that out. Okay, Donna is with us from Canada. Related question, what makes B12 high? You know, just taking B12. <laughs> yeah, and that doesn't mean that you're in danger or that's a bad thing, but just ingesting B12 does that. More and more over time, I'm getting to be less of a fan of massive doses of B vitamins in general, but high B12 is not a danger. I actually just wrote an article about B6. High B6 is a pretty common danger, but B12 is generally harmless but it mostly just means you've taken some B12 recently. Sonora Susie, when switching, I don't understand the context of that. I don't know what you mean by that. Um, let me grab one or two of the pre-submitted questions that I had queued up here again. Here we go. Um, I've got a lot of screens going. <laughs> I can't always keep up with which one's where. Uh, there's that one. Okay, so I need this one that's on there. Ha, got it. 
Okay, so now here is one that came in, a couple that came in that were related. Uh, someone that gets weaned off thyroid meds is the thyroid heal. Gene asked this and hey there, Gene, I think I saw you pop on a little bit ago. So is the thyroid healed when you're weaned off of meds? Um, yeah, it can happen. It can get to where your thyroid no longer needs replacement therapy. Now, in that case, there still is a risk of it coming back again, and the odds of developing problems are higher than they would be had it never happened, but yep, it can heal. So those with thyroid disease, somewhere between uh, 60 to 80% can fully reverse disease by following what's in the thyroid reset diet. We've got multiple clinical trials on that. Those who are on their medication already, somewhere around 40% of them can need no medication and roughly 84% can need less medication. And that's with not regaining symptoms and with retaining healthy thyroid levels. So totally possible. And in those cases, yes, it can heal. The autoimmunity can also reverse. So yeah, good question and a yes to that. Um, so yeah, this is about the discussion of de-prescribing about needing less medication. I'm gonna talk a bit more about this one and I'm gonna grab a few of the new ones that are coming in live. So. You know, Liz asked one, is there a connection between low iron and low B12? You know, Liz, thank you for that because I didn't really explain that as well as I could have. So with this autoimmune thing I was talking about, this atrophic gastritis, there's a progression of events. And typically as the disease starts to get worse, the first thing that happens is uh, there's an autoimmune marker called APCA or uh, antiparietal cell antibodies. That first becomes positive then the antiparietal cells become damaged where many of them cannot work. They're not gone, but there's fewer of them. And initially that causes low iron. When the disease progresses, it also blocks the formation of a thing called intrinsic factor, and that's needed for B12 assimilation. So iron drops off and then B12 drops off afterward. If the disease really continues, we can start seeing zinc and a lot of the nutrients get low too, but typically iron is first and B12 is second. So yeah, I didn't really explain that well. Uh, related one, okay, this is a great one, Kim. Can hair loss occur if blood work numbers are good worth trying low iodine diet? So Kim, uh, hair, loss from, hair loss can occur from thyroid autoimmunity and it can occur from low iron and it can occur from very high cortisol. Those are the three most common causes for our audience here. And what you're asking about is low iodine diet, which has a big effect upon thyroid autoimmunity. So yes, positive thyroid antibodies, especially thyroid peroxidase, when it's very elevated, can be a driver for hair loss. Antithyroglobulin can as well. And we've got a lot of data about the thyroid reset diet reversing those sides of autoimmunity. Abnormal thyroid levels which can often be the result of thyroid autoimmunity, they can also cause hair loss. So those things kind of overlap, but either one can do it. Some people have high antibodies, but normal thyroid levels. And then others can have abnormal thyroid levels, but, but um, normal antibodies. So either or both can be a culprit. And they're both good indications for the thyroid reset diet. So really good question. Another thing about hair though, is we've been talking a bit about iron. That can be a big driver. And that can be a completely separate factor, or it can be something that overlaps with those other problems to where some combination of them are what's giving rise to the hair loss. So here's one that someone just asked that I think, oh, you're the same one that sent the question a bit ago. So perfect, perfect timing. Uh, can thyroid nodules heal? Without medication, did reset diet five months ago? And great question, the easy answer is they can. Uh, there's another option that can help that, and this is nodule control. Let me get a link up here for you guys. This one is really neat. There's been several clinical trials on the ingredients in nodule control, and they've shown that there can be a 32. This is kind of a misleading thing. The average decrease has been about 30 to 50% in nodule size, but it depends upon how big they were starting out. And for some people, the decrease was like 90% or greater. And for some, there was no decrease. But when you average it all together, you see about a 30 to 50% size decrease in nodules. So yes, they can do quite a bit better. And I really do encourage the thyroid reset diet as a big part of that. But nodule control can be a really good adjunct 
that can help all that go more quickly. And yeah, each of the ingredients had clinical trials showing that they have this large effect on that. Even without doing other things, it can be useful. So really good question. Okay, so related questions. I talked a little bit about deprescribing, and I see a question here about that. Let me grab one more of these. And I've got to just catch my breath for a second, you guys. Um, there's a bunch of you here today. We've got a really nice group, and I'm seeing a lot of good questions. Thank you so much for that. I'm really happy to, to take some time and talk to you all and share things that might be useful. Uh, you, you can do better. These are things that people can improve from. And I'm excited to have some information that can help in those ways. And I'm glad to make use of my time to share that. And I'm also knowing that I can't get all of them. So please know that we'll look at these questions afterward as well and come back and post them on the Facebook and Instagram, uh, direct message them in. I watch these in all these areas and these become the topics we cover here, but I'm also making a big new group of blogs for the coming months. And I'm gonna base them on what you guys wanna learn more about. And same thing about new books. This is where it all comes from. So please do keep sharing them and know that even if I can't get every one, they do sink in, they do come out eventually. And you might find too, if I can't get your question, I may have written a blog about it. So you can always search Alan Christensen and then, you know, like deprescribing or Alan Christensen and iron or Alan Christensen and hair loss. And you'll find a bunch of stuff there already. While you're here with me live, you've got the option of asking more detail than you can ask by just finding a blog. You can put the personal parameters of your situation and say, in this situation, how does this play out? What do I do? And just know that when I'm here with you guys live, I'm happy to help at that level. And I can't prescribe and I can't treat, you know, I can't play doctor here on the internet, but whatever I can do that I can say that will help to you specifically, I'll help you really apply this. Okay. So here's an awesome one. I have Hashimoto's and hypothyroidism. Is it okay to alter my diet lifestyle even though I'm an athlete who works out two to three times a day? So is it okay to alter diet and lifestyle? So EGM on Instagram, please look at the thyroid reset diet. The, the thing I'm really excited about is that first off, we've got hard, hard evidence. We've got many large clinical trials with control groups showing that this diet can reverse the disease for the vast majority of people. And the few that it doesn't reverse the disease, it greatly improves it. Now, the other thing why I jumped on your question is that it's not an extreme diet, that any food category you can think of, you can still eat. It's just a matter of knowing in each category, what are the healthy, safe, lower iodine options. But you don't have to starve or go into a caloric deficit or cut out massive categories of food or compromise your training and your recovery, you can do just fine with your athletics. It's a matter of just working around and finding the things that are most compatible. A lot of the popular diets you'll hear about cut out large numbers of food categories. And I don't think that's a healthy thing. I don't really recommend doing that. There's so many ways in which your bowel flora gets compromised, your nutrient levels run lower, not, not useful. So yes, you can do diet and lifestyle to make a big difference on your thyroid function and you can still eat <laughs> and you can still train hard and have fun. So kudos for you for doing that. Let's see, uh, Hannah. Yeah, Hannah, I'm not sure if you were here before, but you also have the option if you wish of doing a second opinion consult. Hannah is saying that she wanted to work with us, but saw that she wasn't in one of those states uh, yeah, and the, the second opinion consult, I wasn't clear about that, the thyroid opinion consult, doesn't matter what state you're in. You can be any state, any country, and you can book me for a little time and we can talk through your particulars. So that is available for wherever you're at. Um, all right, I got to pick and choose and grab a few more. So Frankie, I've seen Frankie here before on thyroid meds for 22 years and should have never been on them and able to come down from 1.5 grain to three quarters of a grain basically without problems. Is it possible to ever be off meds entirely? Frankie, great question. It often is, and I don't know if you've seen my article on deprescribing or not. I'll get this link up just in case you've not, but to be on less and to be on an amount that's not in excess of what your body needs is a huge, huge shift for your health. That is an incredible win and it puts you at a much better place for longevity, for 
uh, lower disease risk for better quality of life. So whatever happens, you've made really good headway by doing that. And it was totally appropriate and super helpful. Uh, I just put up a link to a blog post that talks all the details about deprescribing the things to consider. Some quick cliff notes of that. Uh, if you're not already, follow the thyroid reset diet. If you're not on good micronutrients, look at the daily reset bundle as your best overall option. If you've got antibodies, consider antibody support as an easy way to help lower the overall inflammatory response. And then work with a doctor or get some guidance on the whole process of deprescribing. In the article I shared that link, there's some math as far as how one goes about decreasing a dose in the time frame. Another big thing to know about those that are tapering medication, it's actually okay if levels change during the taper, and it's even okay if some minor symptoms surface. That's pretty normal for those who are successful. But if new symptoms emerge or if bad symptoms show up and they're progressive during the process, it may be time to pause and stay where the level that you're at or even go back a step. But the odds of someone coming down further are high and many can do quite well like that, especially when they're doing those corollary steps. So yeah, good, good progress so far, Frankie. Um, so I'm looking at a lot of great questions and kind of picking and choosing. Uh, here's an easy one. This is from Instagram, one of our Instagram friends. How do we get the best minerals in our water for Hashimoto's? Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, I've got no minerals in my water. <laughs> So what happens is there are areas that have naturally occurring magnesium in the water, and that's, that's harmless enough. But your water normally isn't really a big source of your minerals. Water's a good thing all by itself, and really the cleaner and the purer it is, the better. But I don't, I don't add water or, or I don't add minerals or electrolytes to water. I don't see a good reason to do so. If you are doing prolonged activities in really hot weather, like more than three hours at a time, then it is worth replenishing electrolytes. But on a daily basis, otherwise, no. So electrolytes, the main things are sodium, potassium, chloride. Uh, we get those. Uh, sodium, we can easily get too much. We rarely get too little. And potassium, that's pretty much produce. So the more quantity and the more variety of produce we're getting, the better that way. And similar stories about magnesium and calcium. But our water is just not really a rich source of those. When water does contain a lot of calcium or a lot of other minerals, it's almost never precise, meaning there's a lot of things you wouldn't want in there. So no, I don't encourage supplementing that way, and I don't myself. Um, let's look over and grab one or two more. Okay, so just Hannah, again, I do have digestive symptoms, working on healing my gut. 49, thank you so much. Yeah, Hannah, wherever you do medically, please do consider atrophic gastritis, and please do take a look at that article and read that one, that could be quite relevant for you. Everything you said is pretty classic for it. Deb Holcomb, I was put on generic Cytomel along with Armor with the Cytomel twice daily. What are the best times to take Cytomel? Deb, I was just speaking to some friends who are research scientists and formulators of thyroid medication. None of us can find any justification for needing more T3 on top of Armor or taking thyroid medications more than once daily. Now, I know those are popular ideas, but when we really get down deep into how the body works on its own when it's healthy, it doesn't quite make sense. So proportions, so Armour contains T4, T3, T2, totally cool, all good. Cytomel is T3. Now, the human body normally has a ratio of about four to one parts of T4 to T3. A lot of doctors will look at thyroid blood tests, T3 and T4 levels, and they'll think that they need to be at a certain T3 level. They're trying to put the T3 on the high end of the range. And sometimes they do T3 by itself, or they add T3 on top of armor. Um, I think there are some drawbacks to that approach. And I'm going to put a link to an article that I wrote about why I think that and what I've seen clinically and what I would recommend instead. This is called how high should my T3 be? And in a case like that, I can see a lot of circumstances where someone who's on armor would do better being on a little less T3. And in those cases, you can include T4 with it, T4 and armor. And there's a lot of folks that don't need T3 that can do fine on T4 only. Not everyone by any means, but many. So there's a few of my general thoughts about T3 and T4, but yeah. And also then timing of day. So thyroid hormones, they follow a circadian cycle. 
We make a lot when we wake up. We make a lot when we're in our deep stages of sleep, but we don't make as much in the daytime. So some people have confused how T3 is absorbed with how T3 is excreted. So how fast you excrete a medicine, how fast you pee and poop it out, that's how often you take a medicine. How fast a medicine absorbed, that's not a basis for how often you take it. It's really how fast you excrete it. And T3 excretion is 24 to 36 hours. It takes a day to get it out. So it's taken once daily. The other thought is that we make our biggest amounts of it early in the morning and late at night. So you wanna mimic the body circadian cycle. Um, one or two related questions. Uh, quick one from Sean. If an elderly patient requires a very low carb diet to maintain ketosis to treat Alzheimer's, how will that impact the thyroid? So Sean, I've not looked at the research on this, but I don't believe there are published studies about a ketogenic diet treating Alzheimer's disease. Uh, I understand the rationale, but it's kind of a misunderstanding. So ketones, are used as a fuel and also as a building block. And the irony about brain function is that the more ketones are forced, for the, the more ketones are only available as a fuel, the less they are available as a substrate for tissue repair. So I can think of reasons why that would be contraindicated as well. But as a generalization, we've got pretty good data showing that when someone is in a ketogenic diet, it will lower their body's secretion and activation of thyroid hormones. So. Yeah, if there were a large clinical trial showing that a ketogenic diet improved clinical outcomes in Alzheimer's, I would totally change my, and had no adverse effects, I would change that. I'm pretty confident that data does not exist. I understand how someone can theorize that it would help, but I can also see how you could theorize that it would make things worse. So yeah, you can theorize things in a lot of ways. So I wait on, wait for good data. Um, let's see. <laughs> Frankie, follow-up comment. I've read your article, have done the, the thyroid reset diet, and hope it works for me in the long run. Yeah, keep up the good work, Frank. You're doing a lot of good stuff. Um, Kathy, ARD, can I have half a daily reset shake at night before bed? And how much is a serving of carbs in the ARD? So the serve, having it at bed, and so a couple of thoughts about this. So the shake, the carbs in the shake are from resistant starch. You probably know that, Kathy. But as such, they have a minimal count towards carb intake because they're metabolized so slowly and only partially. So don't worry about those towards total carb targets, but towards the bedtime, that's a, that's a great habit. And many people find that it helps them stay asleep better and not wake up with their mind racing because they don't get a blood sugar drop and a cortisol spike. Okay, let's see. Here's one I can address easily. Um, oh, where did it go? I saw it a moment ago. Can thyroid nodules cause suffocation in the neck region during pregnancy? So a couple questions here. Can nodules cause a pressure sensation in the neck? For sure. Can they be worse during pregnancy? Yep, they sure can. So yes on both counts of that. And good thing to be aware of though, definitely. Um, if my TSH is technically normal range, but for myself, I think it's too high, what can I do? So Jordy, yeah, if you wanna, I'm gonna wrap up pretty quick, but if you wanna put a follow-up question, I'm happy to explain that further. If you feel it's too high, so normal range, now there's a lot of data about normal versus optimal, and it really applies most for those who are medicated. Now, people who are in the normal range but on the high side of it, they often have a greater number of symptoms and greater severity of symptoms. More fatigue, easier weight gain, those are big ones. So we know if they're already on medication, it's better to have them at the lower end of the normal range, but still inside of it. But if someone's not on medication, even though a high normal TSH may cause symptoms, in almost all cases, going on medication, even if it lowers the TSH, it almost never helps the symptoms and it actually doesn't improve the health. So Jordy, if you're someone who's on medication and you feel that you do better when your TSH is on the lower side, that's quite true and you're not unusual. And in those cases, that can be a consideration of making an adjustment to the medicine with your doctor. But the thing I ask more and more about is, was the medication indicated to begin with? You know, did you have a diagnosis that the medication could help with? 
most thyroid diagnosis, most versions of hypothyroidism, medications don't help with. People are put on them anyway. I put a few articles up about de-prescribing and some of the links. Check those out. I talk about this issue more so in them. Let me see if there's one or two more that I can get quickly here. We've got an awesome sized group today. Thanks for coming, you guys. This has been a lot of fun. Um, let's see. There was one or two very early along that I wanted to get back to. So Vincent had one. Vincent, um, if you're still around. Thanks for your patience, my friend. Uh, can hyperthyroid go into remission from methimazole long-term? My doctor already wants to nuke my thyroid and assuming an endo will say the same. Vincent, so hyperthyroidism is generally caused by Graves' disease. When it is, and when someone is brought out of hyper back to the normal range, over an 18-month period, they've got about a 90 to 95% chance of going into remission. So heck yeah, that's quite common. Now, there are those that do not respond to methimazole. There are those that do not tolerate methimazole. In those cases, then that's a different story. But if you respond to it and tolerate it, there's a very good chance of it causing your condition to go into remission. Vincent, methimazole works by blocking the uptake of iodine. If you look at the thyroid reset of diet, the thyroid reset diet, it helps there be less extra iodine floating around in your thyroid. So methimazole doesn't have to work as hard and you don't need it as long. It's a great adjunct. The other thought is that there's a blend I've made called hyperthyroid support. I'm gonna put that up here too. There's a lot of ways by which micronutrients can help hyperthyroidism stay in remission and also help lower a lot of the complications from hyperthyroidism. There's good data on nutraceuticals doing all of those things. And the good data is what I use to make hyperthyroid support. So all these new blends, I just spent the time that I was writing the Thyroid Reset Diet, I was going through all the known literature on thyroid disease and food and also on nutraceuticals. And I had a blank slate. I said, look, what would be the ideal blend to do this? And then I made it, you know, so that, that's where these came from. These aren't other products that were used for other things. They're not private label. They're totally custom and they're made just for those purposes. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> so funny, we are all holding our breath and leaning into the screen to see if our questions will get answered at the end of office hours live. You're so funny, Kathy. Uh, we are kind of winding it down. Um, so related questions, uh, good general questions. How to lower TSH in early pregnancy? My TSH is 10, Nabila. Wow. So during pregnancy, TSH of 10 this is a conversation with the doctor. Now, if you're on medication, it would simply be a matter of adjusting the medication. If you do have a lot of extra iodine sources, it would be good to avoid those. We now know that iodine is needed during pregnancy, but not as much as people thought before. So in the thyroid reset diet, I have the reset phase and the maintenance phase. During pregnancy, the maintenance phase is appropriate with two servings of yellow light foods. That way you're getting exactly good amounts for you and the baby, but not extra amounts for the thyroid. But yes, that's a conversation with your doctor, with a doctor. Um, Liz, would you recommend stopping using of iodine salt? Yes, Liz, I would. And there's iodized salt, salt that has added iodine, and there's salt that has naturally occurring iodine. So those that have added iodine, they say so. They say with added iodine but most versions of sea salt and pink Himalayan salt have a lot of naturally occurring iodine. So towards the goal of helping thyroid function get better, I encourage using iodine-free salts. And the ones I like the most are diamond brand kosher salt. Uh, that's my personal favorite. Also Morton's, it's a really good version of sea salt. And then Celtic light gray is another option for those who like sea salt. But those are all in the thyroid reset diet. So yeah. Okay. Um, oh, okay. So Jordy, thank you for adding clarification. My TSH is 3.3 and I can gain weight easily and you're not on medication. So Jordy, yes, yes, yes. Now there are a lot of doctors that would love to put you on medication for that, but the data is completely clear that the medication would lower your TSH if you took enough, but it wouldn't change your weight loss. But helping your thyroid might make a difference. So yeah, Jordy, grab the thyroid reset diet and dive into that, take a look at that. 
you can often improve your scores. Jordy, I don't know if you've looked at your thyroid antibodies, but you may look at them as well. In a lot of cases when the TSH is creeping up, the thyroid antibodies are also high. And there's pretty strong data they can be big drivers of easier weight gain. And also they can respond well to the iodine regulating thyroid reset diet. All right, I think I'm gonna wind this one down pretty quick. Lots of great questions, you guys. Um, thank you for that. Uh, thank you all for coming today. And I will be back next week, same time, same place. So more questions and hope to see you all back real soon. In the meantime, have a beautiful evening and we'll talk shortly. Bye-bye. All right, we'll stop this one. And at the